Happy Education Week and welcome to a recorded session of the webinar Demystifying Open, Open Educational Resources at NSCC. Your hosts for this session are Kate Snyder, Special Advisor, Teaching and Learning at NSCC, and Lynn McGregor, that's me, Copyright Officer for the college. There were some technical uh, difficulties with recording the live session, so there is a two-minute new introduction that is uh, recorded after the session, and then you'll probably notice um, a bit of a change in the audio as the video recording is then connected to the live session. So the session is about open educational resources and demystifying open and looking at, at open educational practices at NSCC. So let's move right into myth number one. OERs require special skills to use. When in fact, no, no additional skills are required. You have the skills you need already. There's nothing additional you need to do or acquire. OERs are just educational resources that have an open copyright license. That's what's special about them is the open licensing. But they're a resource um, like any other. And many of our faculty are already using OERs in their courses as supplementary materials, whether those are images, videos, opus, open access readings. Some faculty are using open textbooks, revising syllabi and assessments. And the support for finding OERs to match your learning outcomes is available. It's part of the infrastructure of support that exists already. It's available from your campus libraries. And there are a variety of well-designed OER support materials that are available to guide and use your adaptation of these incredibly valuable resources. We then move into a definition of open educational resources. And this is where we're going to now join the live recording session. We are going to talk more about the details as we go on, but Lynn is also going to share a little bit about a solid definition I am. for OER. And I'm just, just going to take a check uh, a second here. Whether, um, I didn't hit record. I'm going to, I sent Andrea a chat. I'm just wondering, Andrea, if you wouldn't mind hitting the record uh, button. Oh, I can see recording has started, so it's thank you if that was Andrea. I will get back on task here. So I just wanted to emphasize that OERs are just education resources that have an open copyright license. It's as simple as that. Um, so this is why no skills are required, because what's special about them is they have an open copyright license. And then when we look at how do we define open educational resources, I like this uh, definition by the Hewitt Foundation because I think they do an excellent job of really succinctly describing what an open educational resource is. It's any teaching, learning, and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access, use, adaptation, and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions. Wonderful definition. Just going to go to our, our next myth, myth number two. Open simply means free. This is a super common myth and one that we really, really want to demystify and get clarity on. Um, open means you have permission, permission in that open license to employ the five R's of OER at no cost. So that's where the free comes in, but the free is only part of it. For something to be open, for any resource to be open, you have to be able to reuse it, revise it, remix it, redistribute it, and retain it. And I think once you understand the 5R activities and 
you know, how much that encompasses, that free is a very small part of that. Something can be free and retain the very restrictive all rights copyright licensing model. For something to be open, you have to be able to employ the five R's. And I, oh, I think I'm still on myth number three. I'm just sort of looking at my cue here for which myths are mine. Myth number three, all OERs are digital. Again, really common myth. And no, OERs can be any format. The native format is digital. That part is true. But you can always make print versions. If print is what works best for your purpose, print it. But one of the uh, many um, benefits of OERs is it's just speaking to that open license. It's not format specific. An OER can be a website, PDF, ebook, videos, and it can be any kind of resource, not just textbooks. It can be an entire course. It can be labs. It can be assignments. It can be test banks. It can be any kind of educational resource where a creator has chosen to put the open copyright license on it. And that takes us to Kate and myth number four. I really love this one. I have this conversation a lot. Um, we have a lot of people who are concerned that OERs may not meet the same sort of quality standards as for example, traditional textbooks. So in this context, I'm just going to speak a little bit to that textbook comparison. And I actually believe, based on the evidence we've seen in the OER landscape, that the quality of the uh, peer review quality of, text, of OER textbooks and other materials is as high, if not higher, than we see with typical textbooks. So there is a rigorous peer review process with OER. There are collaborative authors involved many times. And I think it's important for us to know that that's not always the case with every textbook. So I think there is a high bar set with OERs. Um, I think the, the really exciting piece of the landscape is that so many talented authors who have been publishing traditional textbooks or traditional learning resources are moving into the OER landscape because so many people in education really believe that it's critical to get students high quality content in as an accessible format as possible, both sort of financially accessible but also in some of the other ways we're talk we'll talk about accessibility. So it's so important for us to understand that OERs are absolutely high quality resources. And one of the best things we can do is review them ourselves and tweak things that we know might need tweaking. So we'll talk more about that later, but yeah. there is so much potential here for, um, for us to dispel this myth and really get out front and say to our colleagues and to, to ourselves, OERs meet a very high bar for quality standard. So the next myth is yours as well. I'm going to advance the slide here in just a sec. Whoop, here we go. Myth number five. Again, speaking to especially any um, faculty who might be on the call, because I know this is a common concern, open textbooks more and more include additional learning resources. So things like um, learning materials for the classroom that you would see similarly attached to a textbook, like sometimes, for example, PowerPoints or assessment ideas or um, other resources faculty can pull into the teaching and learning kind of part of their of their class. There was a belief that open textbooks in particular didn't have those type of resources, but you know what they do in many cases now because it is an important part. And really, one of the reasons they do and that they're so robust is that faculty teams are building them together. So they are really able to customize customize resources for the classroom in a way that we haven't seen in traditional textbooks before. So we're much more nimble with what we can do with additional resources in, the, in um, 
the open landscape. And the other cool thing, for those of you who are really looking to push your practice further, is a lot of faculty are engaging students in the co-creation of learning materials that would go into this sort of open sphere. So you may have an open textbook and some of the resources for the classroom are co-constructed with students. And what an exciting place for us to kind of explore when students can really dig in and understand content by developing cool resources. So there are so many teaching and learning potential um, options around open, but I do want to demystify the idea that that for a faculty who um, really values the ability to pick and choose from those textbook resources um, for, for instructors, they still do show up in open. Um, do you want to hear feedback as it's being typed in I, while you're talking? I see Terry's feedback. So, so um, that's lovely feedback from Terry. And I would just um, uh, add to what Kate is uh, said about the, the lack of ancillaries to point out that um, OpenStax textbooks, they very proudly state that all of their textbooks have ancillaries. Uh, BC Open Campus textbooks, again, um, a, a lot of their textbooks have ancillaries or they're in the process of creating them. And this is where the collaborative process uh, that Kate's referring to when faculty are using their students as contributors, um, looping it back in and sharing it in um, back out so that others can benefit um, from using them as well is a huge part of this uh, process and really contributes to the movement. Um, and in looking for um, open textbooks with ancillaries, I would encourage you to reach out to your awesome campus librarians and uh, use them as a, as a resource in uh, helping you discover uh, where these awesome resources are. And one of the reasons I didn't say ancillaries is because I can't. <laughs> so I kept avoiding it. So I'm glad Lynn said it multiple times. All right. um, oh, it's good to see. And Sean, thanks for jumping in. So Sean's a faculty member who's jumping in and saying he's using some of the OERs out of BC campus and um, that they're working well. So that's awesome. Oh, and this, you know what this speaks to, Kate? And this is something Kate and I have talked a lot about is we have OER champions known and unknown. So Sean, you are to me an unknown OER champion and I'm so thrilled and you know at the risk of being overexcited and enthusiastic about this topic which I have been accused of being um, I'm so thrilled to see that you're using um, OERs and um, what I would add in this context is if you found an OER that is right for you and you want to adopt it as is it's still worthwhile reaching out uh, to campus uh, library or the copyright office because we have ways to support you in using that resource. Um, one of the examples is uh, on our, um, we can embed the textbook into a content, content box, give you the embed code that you can then embed that textbook right in your Bytespace course. Students never lose the textbook because it's always embedded right in the course. That's just one example of the way that we can support you in the adoption of an open textbook. Yeah, and I think that dovetails so nicely into this next myth, which is, let me say to the faculty who want to throw something, this is not me saying that you are not busy, <laughs> because I know how busy you are. What this is, is um, we really want to demystify the idea that using an OER adds a ton of extra work. That is absolutely a myth. So. The idea is we know you're busy and OERs are just part of streamlining that busyness and not adding new work. So faculty are already reviewing textbooks and other learning materials like videos and images and uh, modules and websites and all of these things that faculty are already exploring. So we are just suggesting OER is part of the landscape that we should explore from a win-win perspective. Um, I think that Terry pointed it out really well, and I'll just, I'll just um, sort of echo what Terry said. The beauty with OER is that we can customize and localize when we want to or when we're able to. So we don't have to, but we can, which is such an incredible opportunity to create 
you know, we were talking with a, fact, or with a colleague earlier about the opportunity to create local case studies and things like that that we don't have the opportunity to do with um, traditional learning resources, publisher resources. Um, and the other thing we want to point out is you don't have to customize if you don't want to. There's so much one-to-one -one adoption. So we're asking if you're at your faculty working group and you're considering textbooks, have you turned to your library team to say, can you curate a list of open resources for us? So when we're exploring textbooks, we're considering open in that conversation. Um, and I think we are going to continue to say this, and we will come back to it at the end, but this is not work that anyone expects faculty to do on their own. No. We want to, we encourage you to, if you feel able and that you have the time. Like Sean. Like Sean. <laughs> but maybe Sean was like, hey, there was a resource out there I could have turned to. Um, there are resources around, and you will be supported in this. So even in the busyness of the work, know that there are people who can wrap sort of around this work and support you. And I, I think that there there's a sub-myth um, hidden in here. Ooh, and a sub-myth. A sub-myth. And you, right. you've, you've touched on it, but I just want to uh, suss it out and highlight it a bit more because... I think both Kate and I have bumped into this in talking to faculty, where the myth is that I have to adopt, I have to, when I, if I adopt something, I have to customize it, and I don't have time to do that. No. You, you have the option of customizing, but it's a myth that you must. You, you can use it as is. You don't have to invest time, but the beauty is you can customize if you want to. And I just want to um, illustrate this with a story from uh, a pilot project that's in place right now with an open textbook, uh, an introduction to sociology textbook in the School of um, Access, and I'm going to mess up the new name, Access and Languages. Education Educational and language. and Languages. Yep. Thank you, Kate. Um, and one of our faculty uh, in Marconi was teaching um, using the textbook in her class and there was a segment that de dealt with uh, residential schools and in the course of uh, teaching it was identified that the visual in the textbook was um, labeled incorrectly uh, and the reason her student knew this is she attended that residential school so she knew that the the cut line identifying it as one school uh, was not right. And so what the instructor did is um, got the uh, student to write a first-person account um, of her experience in a residential school, and they put in the appropriate uh, cut line to go with the visual and replaced um, the uh, content in the textbook with this new customized localized first-person student account. And I, and I maybe should sort of frame that a little bit more so you can understand. The way the sociology textbook is written is it introduces main concepts and then it highlights them with a, in a, contact, a content box where they um, put in a, a story to illustrate the, the concept. So this went into the box where it's the story to illustrate the concept. So it's a lovely example, I think, of responsiveness on the part of uh, the faculty and how the using the open textbook allowed them to immediately correct an inaccuracy and then add uh, the, lo uh, the localization and the customization. And student voice. Wow, and, that's, yeah, and that story voice. has so many pieces. I know Jill, Jill Provo is on the call and is thinking about how in so many ways um, OER is supportive of our commitment to educational equity. And so we'll talk about that a little more as we go forward. Yeah, right. see, I knew it. I knew you were waiting for it, Jill, with the big yes in the... Okay, so were we finished on that one? Yeah. I kind of yeah. moved to the ne along to the uh, next myth, which is OER are hard to find. Uh, and to this I say, your campus librarians are experts at locating resources and creating curated lists of resources. Uh, and an OER is just another kind of resource. Remember, there's nothing that's, you know, you don't need a special skill to use OER. Um, 
So it's all about if you need help finding a re resource, you go to the same people you would go to for finding any kind of resource. And uh, hopefully that's your campus librarians. You can also come to the Copyright Office. And what we do is um, you give us, uh, tell us what you're looking for, share your course outline, share your outcomes. We create a curated list of potential open, uh, open educational resources uh, to be considered. And the faculty are always and will always remain the subject experts. Um, the reviewing and the deciding lives with faculty. You um, review that resource list. And I think of this as um, works best when it's a collaborative process when there's uh, an exchange. So uh, I'm in the process now of working with an instructional designer and the faculty um, that she's supporting. And they gave me the list of, um, not the list, but the outcomes and the uh, course outline. I gave them back my first list, curated list of resources that I think that um, match what they're looking for, but it's a process. So the feedback I get back is, uh, yes, you know, some of these books are perfect and I can see how they might fit into this part of the course, but we still need some more resources that, um, you know, fit a different part. And then it's that sort of clarification for me of what they're looking for. So you know, I go back to the drawing board and with the clarification they've given me, I'm looking for uh, more content to create a, a, another curated list to give back to the subject experts, the faculty who are going to be teaching this to decide whether they want to adopt as is, whether they uh, want to combine different resources together, whether they need or have the time to customize. Um, so that's sort of an idea of the process, and uh, hopefully uh, your, your, the myth number six is being dispelled. Um, there is uh, amazing support for you in finding OER, and it's just a matter of asking and understanding um, that that support is there for you or here for you at the college. I'm going to explain all the licenses. Just kidding. When is? Um, actually, it's I so could. easy. I could. It's That's so right. easy. It hey, so good. Easy. We were having this discussion earlier. Um, uh, I love this myth because, uh, well, my, my role at the college is um, about educating uh, about copyright um, and OER, but the licenses attached to OER, they simplify copyright. It, it makes it easier. Uh, not more difficult, and um, the I think that the licensing framework is so simple and so intuitive, uh, we need to just demystify it, and we need to just uh, instead embrace it as, yes, it's simplified, and I can do it. Um, if you look at the... Uh, two character abbreviations, CC, BY, SA, NC, and ND, if you understand what those abbreviations stand for, you understand how to interpret a Creative Commons license. It's, and I think they've done an amazing job of making it really intuitive and highly identifiable. So if we're looking for content and we see the CC with a circle around it, it's an amazing visual cue to tell us this is open. Some, some form of open license is attached to this content because that CC with a circle around it is there. And then the, the nuance is added to it by um, the characters that may or may not come after it depending on the kind of license that's there. Um, and it just provides this standardized way of creators being able to share their content. 
um, one of the um, things to remember about a Creative Commons license is, um, with the exception of the CC0 at the top of the uh, pyramid here, that's essentially putting uh, content into the public domain, all of the other licenses are a license where the creator is retaining their copyright. They're retaining their copyright, but they are at the same time attaching, sharing, and openness to it. So the creator, instead of saying, all rights reserved, I own it, nobody can use it without asking me first, they're intentionally attaching a license that says, I'm the creator and I own this content, but I want to share it and I am giving you, uh, hopefully, the right to employ those five R's, the five R's that define an OER. And what they're asking for in return is a BY. And a BY is just, who is it by? Give the creator credit. Use it, but always give the creator credit. What a simple concept. So let's not make it difficult. Creative Commons licensing, open licensing, is really pretty simple. Use it, share it, revise it, adapt it, but always give credit. And I think that's a, a, a good guiding principle anyway, that we should be giving credit. Um, and I'm hopefully uh, that myth is um, you're getting more comfortable with Creative Commons uh, licensing as you think about looking at those um, easy, uh, highly recognizable licenses, and you're saying to yourself, I've got this, I can do this. All right, enough about, enough about licenses. Uh, the other thing, just one more thing about the licenses, is you have support. If there's ever, ever any doubt about a license and what you can do with it, you work at an institution where the supports are there. Shoot me an email. It doesn't have to be a long email. You can say, uh, I want clarification on this license, or I want clarification on whether I can, what I can do with this. That's all I need. I'll run with it. I'm sure the same holds for your campus librarians. So don't be afraid to reach out and ask the question, because we're more than happy to be part of the process and support you in this um, journey of adopting and exploring open educational resources. All right, so on to myth number nine and Kate. So, know so many of you on the call, so I know we all share this, the passion around this, this myth. Um, we know that cost as a student issue is a myth. It's all of our issue. This is something we all care passionately about. We care about our students having access to the highest quality materials without creating barriers for them. I can't quote it directly, but from our ed equity policy, one of the um, key areas of focus for us is this idea of resource equity. And are we ensuring that all students have the same access to barrier-free learning experiences? Um, and OER is such a I don't, need, I don't have the right word to say the potential of what OER can do for us in terms of um, giving students access. We know that so many materials we provide to students right now, for example, are cost prohibitive. So that, that is um, right now. We know that we have students who are paying the same amount in textbook costs as they are in tuition. These are things that we can take on as activists sort of in the post-secondary landscape by using OER. We also know that so many publisher materials are not accessible. We are running into situation after situation after situation where students with disabilities in particular are facing so many barriers just trying to get access to their textbook material. And in an OER landscape, we can we can address accessibility from the design uh, level. So we know that those accessibility features are built in. 
This is part, yeah, that's right, Terry. Absolutely, students are waiting. And that is all students are waiting, whether it's waiting for their student loan money to come in, whether it's waiting for um, savings in that you know, part-time job, whether it's waiting because of the system, system barriers we've created in making resources accessible, this is something we can tackle head on. And we, I think so many of us feel like kind of helpless to make movement in some of these big system barrier issues. And OER gives us a chance to skirt right around them and address them head on as faculty, as instructors, as library staff, as student services and academic supports teams. That's right, Terry. We have so many people who are running into that issue of um, traditional publishers not wanting to make formats accessible. And these are questions that we need to ask ourselves at this point in 2020 when we as an institution are so committed to educational equity. Is that acceptable? I would say no. But, you know, that's the work ahead that we need to start saying we can disrupt that practice by looking to alternatives. And there are amazing alternatives. And I want to take this opportunity to just give a shout out to the library team because our library team can do amazing things in the realm of resources yeah. for students and for faculty. So being able to reach out to a campus librarian to say, and library team, um, to say, I'm looking for resources for students that um, might be free and accessible. And can you help me curate a list within this content domain? And your library team can support you in doing that. And what an amazing asset. And so, yes, we're talking about OERs, but absolutely, the library team has already curated amazing videos, amazing images, amazing, I don't know, websites, all kinds of there's, tools. There's a lot of content all kinds of content that we can um, that we can already be using so I would just encourage you if it feels um, if it feels daunting I think Melanie's question er earlier in the chat was a great one and if you didn't catch it um, sure we have our formal pathways where absolutely faculty working group teams can choose to adopt um, for example OER textbooks mm -hmm. as a formal adoption but any faculty anytime can look to use OERs as a supplemental resource in their classroom whenever. And, so and, dive in. And, and, and the resource is there for everyone. That's it's right. not just there for a faculty That's right. working group. Um, you know, your, your campus libraries and the copyright office, we're here to support all of you. And, you know, I think uh, collectively our approach is no question is too big or too small. Um, so, yes, it doesn't have to be going through formal avenues. Um, the, um, you know, the School of, of uh, ac Access and, what's the rest of it? Educa access Education and Language. Okay, a Access Education and Language. You know, they, uh, as a school, are, are the ones who are out front, and w I'm seeing it with um, what the individual faculty are then doing in terms of finding uh, ancillary OERs to supplement what they're doing, um, creating them. Um, the, we tend to see them in the Copyright Office because they get uh, submitted to be printed, at a, and it's a, a way that um, allows us to uh, document and track some of the um, uh, some of the OERs that are, are, are being adapted and used here at NSCC and um, allows us to, um, uh, in, a, in a small way, you know, email back and, and, and celebrate and cheer on uh, the work that they're doing. So it doesn't have to be big. You know, these are just um, smaller uh, classroom, maybe their classroom activities, uh, smaller things that they're finding. Um, that suit their purpose and maybe with a few tweaks um, uh, become customized for their class. So it, it's, and, and that's, this is where that uh, comment about the OER champions known and unknown comes back in because the, I'm, happen, I'm happening to bump into this and be aware that this is happening, but I'm sure that this is the tip of the iceberg and there are lots of other faculty who are finding and adapting and, and using OERs. And, and that's the way Kate opened up this webinar, was talking about the fact that we know that our faculty are already 
already doing this. And so this session today is about um, supporting that work and dispelling some of the myths that may be still lingering um, out there about OERs. Uh, and one thing I would like to just loop back into um, the accessibility uh, feature that Kate was touching on uh, and just how uh, powerful that is. And the most uh, open textbooks are authored in a platform called Pressbooks. And one of the amazing uh, features of Pressbooks is when you create that one text file that is your textbook or it's a course pack or whatever resource it is, um, the leading post-secondaries in this country have all uh, published their OER strategic plans in Pressbooks. So this authoring platform um, with a click of a button when you finished uh, writing the content or importing the written content into the platform, you create multiple outputs with one press of a button. You get a web-based book. You get a PDF optimized for print, a PDF uh, optimized for digital sharing, a EPUB book a proprietary, okay, you trip over ancillary, I trip over proprietary. <laughs> and in copyright, how many times do I have to say that word? Um, formats like uh, a Kindle ebook or a Mobi ebook. So with, the, the, with one button, we get all of these format, formats uh, produced. And to me, that's another kind of accessibility, giving students choice about what format works best for them. Do they want an EPUB? Do they want to read it on the web? Do they want a PDF? Do they want to print the PDF? It allows us to give our students and our faculty way more choice um, and power. And I think that's why when you look around uh, at websites um, and post-secondaries that are a little further ahead than we are and adopting OER, the word power is used a lot because the power is given to us. It's given to you, to you as the faculty who are using the resource because there's so much more that you can do. And okay, I'm starting to get into my super excited nope. mode, I know, but it, 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 the word really sums it up nicely. It's powerful. And I think that's a perfect transition to this last myth that we have that is is actually um, something Lynn is going well, to speak I to. I loaded up the wrong... I'm so sorry I loaded up the wrong PowerPoint. Okay. You start talking, and I am going to upload. Um, you will be glad to know that we have worked on multiple drafts of this. So yes, yes. We've worked yes. hard, everyone, so, on your behalf. Kate, you'll just have to um, talk about something while I um, load something up. So I see, um, I see Terry's question about specialized industry publishers on open. Um, I think the answer is, I don't know that there is a general response to where they are. I think it depends, and I know Lynn can speak to that, and Andrea, if you want to jump in on the text, I'm sure you've had some experiences and, um, that you might want to speak to, but I think it varies, and, and um, we might not be where we need to be quite yet, but I think um, the more institutional momentum there is around OER in post-secondary, the more likely it is that people will start to reframe their thinking on how they're providing those resources. Um, you know, I think in the short term, what I could say, Terry, is in a program where we know that's a fixed cost, we can work really hard on making sure the other costs that are within our control are brought down. So I do, I do recognize that's still a barrier in, around um, you know, how standards documents, for example, are being published. But I do think that gives faculty the opportunity to, to really prioritize then some of the other resources that may not be um, as rigid. So this last slide is kind of to Ron's point. How, Ron, I know you are out there right now. We have gotten you so pumped up and you are so excited to get started with OER and it is kind of like, 
there is a myth out there that we as an institution might not be ready or might not be willing or might not be interested. And, you know, we're here to tell you we are all of those things. And, you know, I did want to do a bit of an intro into this slide that Lynn is going to speak to because Lynn has been working just um, kind of tirelessly and fearlessly to gradually move us. You know, we're, we're a big behemoth to start uh, to you're move. Being too kind. You're being too but kind. Lynn's passion has really pushed us to a place where um, the processes are, and I say processes in sort of um, in quotations because it does, it is flexible, but Lynn has really gotten us to a place where that support is institutionalized. We do have um, ways that for those of you who are interested in engaging in um, exploration of OER, adoption of OER, customization of OER, you have resources. So Lynn is going to speak a little bit to um, what that looks like now and, and sort of how you can find more information to your point, Ron. Um, okay, I, I missed a question there, did I? Okay, so, um, the, Kate's being very kind, but, you know, the way that, um, being the, in the role of copyright officer at the college, to me it seemed like a logical extension of my role to explain not just what restrictive copyright is and what we, you know, how it limits us, but what is an open copyright license and what is the power of that. So there, there are two sides to this, you know, there's the restrictive and then there's the open. And the framework for support, supporting open is the same framework that exists for supporting any other resource um, in terms of whether it's a licensed resource or it's an open educational resource, it's just a resource. And this is where your campus library and library services fits into this model. Uh, we, are, we support open educational resources the way we support any other kind of resource. With the um, added benefit of, I'm hoping and I, that our campus librarians are as excited as I am about this, and I know that some librarians, like uh, Terry, who's with us today, absolutely are. So it's about understanding that uh, this is not a road or a path that you have to go down on your own, um, that your roles are the same as they always have been, which is to be the subject expert, uh, to decide what you want to use or not use, but understanding where the resources are to go out and ask for support. So working with your campus librarian or the Copyright Office to have a curated list created for you. Um, if you're deciding to that you want to customize, uh, we can provide uh, supports and understanding where the best practice tools are, um, what some of the platforms are to use. I've been very actively um, involved in uh, the pilots and doing, providing the the technical side of actually customizing the open uh, resources that uh, are part of the pilot projects, and we, you know, as we move forward, we're going to have to figure out, you know, how we how we support that. But you know, we're in this together. Um, there, hopefully, uh, you're aware of the open web-based guides that we have to support you. Um, the Open Educational Resources Guide it is, in the chat. Um, is an important one and I am sometimes challenged uh, with this new uh, Teams um, meeting. I just, I just added the uh, link to the subject guide in the chat oh, so did you? people okay, need so it. they can. So the important thing about the Open Educational Resources Guide is that it is not static. It is constantly changing. I am constantly adding uh, content here based on um, feedback that I get from, uh, let's see, I'm just going to see if I can share my screen here. And you can tell me if I have uh, 
Now that I've successfully done that, I think I'm showing too much of my screen, but just pull it this way. Uh, so this Open Educational Resources Guide, uh, any tool that I find here that I think would be useful, um, I don't keep it to myself. I post it to this website uh, so that it's discoverable. And it's an open website. Anybody in the world, if they care to, could look at this website. But it's designed to be useful to faculty and students at NSCC. Uh, and our campus librarians and our library staff. So feel free to give me feedback. If there's content here that is missing that you'd like to see, tell me. I'll add it. Uh, I'm constantly adding to this guide. Uh, this is where I mentioned earlier uh, we needed um, a place to promote and highlight the open textbooks that we know faculty are using and on this page uh, the textbooks that we know about we put them into the content box that I was describing earlier and then we can share the embed code for one of these uh, content boxes and it goes into the Brightspace course. The tabs that go along with it if there are ancillary resources they all go in the one box Embed code gets shared, goes into Brightspace. Any changes that get made to the content box automatically reflected in Brightspace. Students can never lose a textbook because it's always in Brightspace. Um, so that is, uh, I guess, one of the ways that if you're adopting, we can support you. Uh, so it's part of including uh, resource support people in the discussion so if we have ways to support you uh, you're going to discover them you're going to find out about them by uh, talking to us um, there and are oh so go ahead go I ahead, was just going to say I see that um, there's a question that I think might be a good one for you around right. um, there uh, was an expectation that only Canadian content could be used in OER in the past Oh, who defined that? I'm wondering if that might be myth number 12. We've identified myth number 11, which was Sean pointing out in the chat that um, a lot of faculty think that um, that using open is something they need to do secretly. So bust that myth. Do it proudly. Yeah. Do it loudly. And do it Oh, visibly. no. We want you to be, you know, <laughs> out there. We want to celebrate. And, um, you know, the, the word that is used in the open educational resource community is OER champion and uh, David Porter who has been a leading thinker and mover and shaker in this field for the you know as long as it's existed in Canada um, it gave a really inspiring keynote here in Halifax in November and uh, very much was encouraging us to be OER champions embrace being a champion find other champions, celebrate where the other champions are. So this is very, please don't do it in secret. You know, let's, let's celebrate this, this work uh, together and support each other. And to the point about Canadian content, um, you know, certainly we're aspiring to have learning materials that are as contextualized as possible. Um, I'm not sure that, and I was just, while we were talking, looking for the, um, the textbook adoption rubric, I don't know if somebody else has that at their fingertips, but um, I'm not sure that that, that is um, something that's a requirement in that rubric, though a consideration of Canadian content I do believe is in there. Um, the beauty of OER is that we can take an American textbook, for example, and customize it in a Canadian context. So, I mean, I kind of think the sky's the limit in that respect, Ella, and I hope that answers your question. Um, we can always make that content more Canadian <laughs> if we need yes. to. So I do think that's the beauty of the flexibility we have with OER and the flexibility of the potential for customization. And, um, oh, and Ron, I see, is it easy to search for topics? And so, Ron, I'm assuming, do you mean on the subject guide or do you mean um, sort of in some of the open platforms generally? Well, um, I think it's easy to search for them. But that's kind of, that's my skill set. I know I might not think it was easy to go in and uh, teach your courses. 
Um, but this is where we make use of each other's skill sets. So you would have the option of maybe sitting down with a campus librarian if you wanted to up your game and be able to uh, have, uh, be able to search more confidently for OERs. Maybe you sit down with a campus librarian to get some tips about where, you know, where are the best places to search, um, what kind of keywords you, you should be searching on, um, given uh, if, if the discussion you would have about the kind of content you're looking for. Or you would have the option of, you know, asking uh, a campus librarian to create that curated list for you. You know, it, it depends on the need. So sit down and have the, have the discussion. Um, just going back to the American uh, content uh, issue, a lot of the Canadian uh, textbooks start, might have started out as a, an American version that has been then taken and customized to create in a Canadian version. The introduction to sociology is a good example of that. The first edition was an American edition, and then it was uh, the, BC, the folks in BC uh, took that open edition, customized it, created a first Canadian edition. They've now created a second Canadian edition. And NSCC, I'm very proud to say, has created a customized version of the second Canadian version. So we can get many versions and iterations of uh, the same uh, work happening. Um, there's not, absolutely nothing from um, a copyright perspective to stop you from taking a resource from anywhere in the world with an open license. World's your, the world is your oyster that way. Um, because BC is further ahead than us, I'm just going to draw your attention to the uh, BC campus guides on uh, adopting, creating, and adapting. So they have a, a, a variety of guides to um, uh, provide steps and some process. Uh, so, you know, I will, would imagine that as we move down this road, we'll take some of those uh, resources and we'll customize and we'll adapt them to the NSCC context. But in the meantime, um, it would, you know, have a look at those. They, have, they provide um, some good information on frameworks. So and I'm just trying to while we are, I'm just looking at the time. Shocking for me, I know, but I am paying attention to the time. And um, I see that we have about five minutes left. And well, I think um, Lynn is looking for another resource to share. I did just want to throw it out to anyone. Are there questions that we haven't answered in the chat or that we haven't discussed that you're still wondering about or comments you might want to make? Um, I'm just wondering even oh, just Andrea if you wanted to if you have a mic or if you want to jump in the chat to speak a little bit to the work that Call is doing might be of interest to folks as well. Uh, can anybody tell me how to just go back to the PowerPoint pre presentation quickly and uh, this happened to me the last time I presented to and I haven't figured out when I stop sharing my desktop how I get back to the PowerPoint and somebody the last presentation that I gave gave me a really quick tip I can't remember it. Uh, no input. Hmm. So oh, while Lynn is, you know, and I am obviously not providing any help over here. Oh, there we go. Andrea is saying use the share screen. Um, I don't know how to do that. Are there any other questions that we haven't addressed? I know we have kind of a diverse group on the call. Is there? Do you know how to do the share screen? It doesn't matter. The last slide really is just what questions do you have? So yeah. um, using the last couple minutes we have, are there any that we haven't addressed? I can give that quick update, Kate. That'd be great, Andrea. Thank oh, you. Oh, sorry. Um, the Council of Atlantic University Libraries, for which we're a member of as NSCC libraries, is uh, embarking on a pilot, uh, which we expect to launch late summer, early fall, of a repository of open educational resources that's Atlantic-based. So 
Uh, what you see in BC campus and eCampus Ontario, there's going to be an Atlantic version coming very soon, which is really exciting for us to be able to share our content, um, be able to share content between our post-secondary institutions that's Atlanticized, uh, maritime focused, that sort of thing. So we're really excited to see that come forward. Yeah, that's going to be really exciting for all of us. I see people are starting to log off because I, I know people must be transitioning now to meetings and, and classes right. at 1. So if we could just push out the postcard before people leave. That's right. Go for it. Okay. So for those of you who are still there, um, perhaps you're aware, perhaps you're not. Uh, as part of Open Education Week, we're looking for feedback. Um, we're looking for feedback about if your course was using an open educational resource, what difference would it make? And to share that with us. And you have two options for sharing. One is to go to your campus library and pick up uh, a print postcard and fill it in. But there's also a digital postcard. Uh, you can just click on um, the link on the Open Education Week page. The link is right here. And uh, submit. Uh, using the digital or the print, doesn't matter, just what's important is sharing and sharing, getting your, your if you're faculty, getting your, talk, take five minutes, talk to your students about it, ask them if they know what an open educational resource is, do they know what it is, and if you were using it, what difference would it make to them and encourage them uh, to complete the postcard. We'd really like to um, get a, uh, some kind of picture of how, how people feel. What do people feel? Um, and we don't know if we don't ask. So oh. we are so grateful to all of you for showing up. We're so excited that so many people are excited about OER the way we are. Terry is saying that students are starting to fill them out and how exciting. And you know, it, it is important for us to recognize that organizations like Students Nova Scotia have really asked us to yes. dive into OER. Students are, are some of the um, largest and most vocal groups in support of OER, as you can imagine. So this is just yet another way of us being more responsive, more equitable, and um, you know, as, as Jill often reminds us to strive for equity, this is yet another tool in our toolbox to do that. And so um, really aligns with our values as an institution. It supports our mission and vision, and I, I think it, it, this is sort of a really exciting revolution that we're starting in, uh, in the world of students. So thank you all for coming. Please reach out with questions, excitement, um, interest, and um, for support. We're here for you. No, quest no question too big or too small. You know, make, make use of those resources, Copyright Office and Campus Libraries. We are um, always there to talk about and help you find um, OERs. So, you know, please, uh, please don't forget about us. We're an important resource to support you on this journey. All right, everyone. Thank the you. The revolution continues. So yeah. That's right. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and we look forward to these discussions all over the province. Lovely, everyone. Share the word.